Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Israel Dialogues. I'm Rabbi Zachary Goodman here at Holy Blossom Temple. I want to thank you for joining us again this afternoon, this morning, this evening, depending on where you're, you're tuning in from. We are thrilled today to be joined by Seema Shine, and I will uh, allow David DeWitt to introduce her uh, more formally in just a moment. Just a few words of housekeeping and gratitude before we uh, jump into the conversation. Um, as always, if you have questions for any of the experts on screen, uh, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Uh, we plan to be together for about an hour and a half this uh, session, ending right around 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so at any time during, this, uh, during the lecture, or the Q&A, please feel free to send in your questions in the Q&A function. Um, lastly, just a word of gratitude to our promotional partners at Artsa Canada, the Canadian Zionist Federation, the Israel and Golda Kachetsky Center for Jewish Studies at York University, as well as the Reform Jewish Community of Canada, and special gratitude to Helena and David Fine for their generous gift of sponsorship. So, with no more ado, I'm going to turn it over to David, to, uh, as he does so well, set the scene, set the stage for us this afternoon. Thank you, David. Oops, sorry, David, you're just muted. I'm going to, there we are. Yeah. There we go. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone um, back to the Israel Dialogues. And in particular, um, uh, we're thrilled to have as our guest uh, Seema Shine from uh, the INSS in, in Tel Aviv, the Institute for National Security Studies. Um, I have one additional unusual uh, comment before I continue, is that uh, our colleague Howard Edelman had been very much looking forward to the session and to moderating it and to meeting uh, Seema uh, personally. Uh, unfortunately, he had an accident a week ago and uh, broke his leg. So he's in a hospital recovering him, recovering, we wish him well. Um, and uh, we will move on from, from there. Uh, Seema Shine is currently the head of the Iran program at the INSS. Uh, and the INSS, for those of you who um, have not been following its growth and development and its significance, uh, many e years ago when I was involved there, it was called the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies with an affiliation at Tel Aviv University. And as it's go grown and transformed, it has now become one of the premier think tanks related to defense and security and strategic issues in Israel and it's recognized worldwide as the leading uh, policy relevant research think tank uh, in the Middle East. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, the, one, one of its senior scholars uh, with us today. Uh, Sima is, it comes to us not in the traditional uh, um, mode of an academic scholar, but rather someone who has de uh, developed her expertise through a combination of research and policy with the added um, significance that brings when you have to make decisions that affect individuals' lives. And it's from this position that um, she speaks on uh, concerns having to do with Israeli security and defense, and today and for much of her career, particular related to Iran. Uh, her last position in, in government was head of the research and evaluation division of the Mossad. And in this capacity, she was in charge of the production of both daily and periodical evaluations on Middle Eastern and international issues. She led security and intelligence dialogues with various counterparts in the international community and was involved in political security, political military meetings with a decision maker. Since retiring from the Mossad in 2007, 
uh, Sima uh, has served as deputy head of strategic affairs in Israel's National Security Council, and then served in the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, where she was responsible, among other things, for the Iranian file and was deputy director general. So it's uh, with great pleasure that we welcome uh, Seema to our program. Um, I'm sure Seema, like me, many of you, met many of my uh, of our listeners have been following what you've had to say in your many presentations uh, for the through the INSS, whether in, in an INSS event or in, as a guest in one of the many other webinars that have been occurring. Um, one of these curious um, uh, positive outbreaks of Zoom since the pandemic, we've all had access to expertise from the world over in ways that many of us might not have had uh, before Zoom and before the pandemic made it such an important part of our lives. So with that, um, our issue today is Iran, the strategic environment, its impact on and, and its importance to Israeli and Middle East, and perhaps more generally global security. And with that, the screen is yours. Thank you again. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a huge pleasure for me and I'm very honored. And I want to uh, suggest that we, um, I start by a short presentation of uh, how we see the situation uh, with Iran, um, generally uh, in the international arena, in the regional arena, as well as vis-a-vis -vis Israel, which is at the end of the day, the most important uh, stretch to Israel. And uh, I'll be very, very happy to have a, a dialogue of uh, questions, Q and A's. I'll be happy to answer any question, even if I didn't, um, mentioned the issue in my presentation. So let's start by say, I want to start by uh, saying that um, we are a year since the Biden administration is uh, in the White House. We are half a year since the new president in Iran, Raisi, is uh, in Tehran. Uh, we are also half a year since there is a new government in Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett after 12 years of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. And we are three and a half years after President Trump decided to leave the uh, nuclear uh, agreement, uh, which we all know to be the JCPOA. Uh, and what does it mean? It means, first of all, that um, we have new personalities uh, in some places but the uh, old problems and, um, and the question would be, uh, I hope I might answer it at the end, uh, we need, perhaps we need new answers to, uh, to those uh, problems that, uh, for, uh, that we are witnessing for so many years. So first of all, where do we stand today uh, with Iran? Uh, and I will start, I prefer to start with the nuclear issue. <coughs> Sorry, because I think at the end of the day, this is the most strategic issue vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, other issues might be more, uh, I would say, more threatening immediately in a very in the in the short term. Uh, the nuclear run might be in the a, a little bit more longer term, but uh, when we are looking on what is a strategic threat vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a medium medium range, I would say a threat. No question that the nuclear one stands as the first one and the most important one. As I mentioned, it's three, it's three and a half years since Trump left the agreement. A year, Iran decided to stay silent and to stay within the agreement, hoping to get the achievements of the agreement via the Europeans, Russians, Chinese, without the American participation. But uh, a, a year later, May 19, uh, the Iranians understood that uh, once the US decides to put sanctions on Iran, especially the secondary sanctions, meaning uh, if, if anyone in the world is doing business with Iran, it will not be able to do business in the US. No one uh, that is important for those economic investments and business would do anything in Iran. And therefore, 
they decided slowly and gradually to leave the agreement uh, without announcing, as Trump has done, that uh, they are leaving the agreement. Of course, they said it is according to the agreement, we are doing that and that. Where do we stand today? Uh, as you all know, the uh, Vienna talks uh, of resuming the JCPOA uh, are already more than eight, more than eight months, even 10 months, I would say, since April, and uh, nothing has been achieved. And the fact that after 10 months, we are still in a situation where the Americans are saying, we don't know if there will be an agreement at the end, and we are very close to the end because of what is happening in Iran. In a minute, I explain. And the Iranians are saying, uh, we don't know if we have an agreement because the Americans are not willing to uh, uh, lift all sanctions that since Trump has left the agreement. Now, we have to understand the essence of the JCPOA was to put Iran in a year from the possibility to decide to have a breakout a, to a nuclear device, a year in the fissile material, not with the device itself. But that was the understanding of the international community that this year would be enough time if Iran decides to break out a, in order to understand that they are doing it, to evaluate the situation and to threaten Iran to go back or to put any kind of pressure that will bring Iran back. We are today in a situation where Iran has enough fissile material, if they decide to enrich it to 90 plus percent, which is the military uh, percentage that is needed, they might do it in three weeks for the first device, in uh, uh, two months for the second one, and etc. So the year has been squeezed. As I am saying, it's not for the device itself, it's for the fissile material that is needed for the device. So it's, it's two different uh, levels, but it is the most important level and the most the one that the international community can uh, observe and can try to deter Iran. Now, this is one of the elements that uh, Iran, Iran has achieved in the years since, it's, since it started uh, to depart from the, uh, depart from the uh, agreement. What is more in, also important is not only the quantities of the fissile material that they already have, but two more important steps that were not done before. One of them is enriching to higher levels than Iran has enriched in the past. Today, they are enriching to 20, which they did in the past, and to 60, which they didn't do in the past. At the same time, they are operating very uh, sophisticated and very advanced Cent centrifuge, which are very different from the one that they are using, they, they, they have been using in their project uh, till now, uh, which means that they will need less time in order to get more material once they operate only with the advanced centrifuge. All these things have been done in the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, Iran, all the knowledge that ha has been acquired by Iran during those years uh, with the enrichment and the, and the operation of the, of the uh, centrifuge is something that even if they decide in Vienna to go back to the, to the agreement by the letter of the JCPOA, Iran has learned much more than it had been before. And this is something that cannot be rolled back, of course. And adding to that is the issue of uh, inspection. The IAEA uh, is not allowed today and in the last year and a half to inspect as it was according to the JCPOA and according to the additional protocol, which was part of the acceptance of Iran in, within the JCPOA. That means that the international community, and I'm not talking about the intelligence because if the intelligence know, knows what happens there, it's one thing, but the, intelligence, but the international community was looking on the project of Iran through the eyes of the IAEA and they don't have it today. And there is no way as the, uh, the head of the uh, IAEA has said, he does not have the tools today to say definitely that Iran is not 
doing things that it shouldn't be doing and is not try is not a, a violating also the rules of the NPT. So we are in a situation where uh, the eyes of the international community are com not completely, but very close to completely closed. Iran is uh, uh, having much more experience in uh, things that are relevant to uh, nuclear devices. And uh, the, the uh, diplomatic talks that are going, diplomacy that is going on in Vienna uh, doesn't bring yet to any conclusion and uh, to any agreement. And the fact that after such a long period, we still, the international community is still saying it's 50-50 if there will be an agreement or not. That means that, uh, that the conception that was by the Biden administration and probably others as well, that once Biden will suggest to the Iranians to go back from the policy of Trump, uh, they will jump on the, the, on the suggestion and immediately go back. Uh, that was a wrong assumption. Iran is not rushing to go back to the agreement and to get the benefit of going back to the agreement by the removal of sanctions. Uh, this is very important to understand because this was the background and this was the, the basis tools of the Trump administration to bring Iran uh, uh, by sanctions, what he was calling by the uh, uh, economic pressure economic, economic uh, the, the very most, mo almost most of the possible uh, sanctions that Iran can put on, on uh, that the US can put on Iran in order uh, either to bring Iran because of what it will happen inside Iran to bring Iran back to a better agreement or perhaps to see a, a waking up of the, of the people to, in the streets and something that will threaten the regime. Uh, as, as you might remember, the uh, National Security Advisor Bolton was talking about a regime change. All these things didn't happen. No, nothing of that has happened. And the fact that Iran is not rushing today back to the agreement means that they evaluate, they might be wrong, but they evaluate that in spite of all the economic problems, and the harshing of the situation for the people. And we see every second day, we see demonstrations of the teachers, the ones of the oil uh, uh, workers and um, others. Every time we see those, uh, uh, those demonstrations with, uh, the, because of the economic pressure, the regime for the time being doesn't think that this situation is putting such a pressure on him that they have to go back and to uh, enjoy the removal of uh, sanctions. So this is the, the issue with the, with the nuclear, uh, with the nuclear um, project where we stand. The, two days ago, there was a resumption of the, of the talks in Vienna. And there is a big question, uh, what will be the future? Uh, the Americans are talking about the end of this month. They started to talk about the, uh, uh, the end of January as the time to get to the agreement and, uh, because, and otherwise there will, there will be no real um, um, non-proliferation interest in going back to the agreement. Now they're talking about the end of February and the big question will be, um, is it the last, uh, the last date that they are putting or uh, the end of February will hear something about uh, the next, uh, ne next month? Um, I want to stop here with the nuclear issue, and I'm sure you will have your questions on this issue and say some words about regional issues as well as international one. Uh, on the regional issue, uh, I, want to, I want to emphasize um, several, three major developments. One is, um, if I have to summarize it, I will quote uh, one uh, uh, Iranian, I think he was a member of parliament, and that was uh, uh, saying we are controlling now four capitals. So they are not controlling four capitals, but no question that Iran today has its influence, not only in Tehran, but also in Baghdad, in Damascus, in Beirut, and in Yemen. And a very, uh, uh, in, a, in this world, they are there also in the Gaza Strip with the, their relations with Hamas. So Iran today, 
they have a lot of problems I, uh, in Lebanon and in Iraq. Not all the, uh, all the population is supporting uh, Iran. Not even all the Shias in Iraq and in Lebanon support Iran. But no question that the influence of Iran 10 years, uh, if we look a decade ago and today, is uh, wider, uh, stronger, and uh, much more important and influential and than it was a decade and, uh, or two ago. Uh, this means, first of all, from Israel's point of view, that we find Iran Iranian uh, fingers and Iranian uh, presence on most of our borders. If it is in uh, Lebanon through Hezbollah, if it is in Syria with their own people in Syria and the militias that they have brought from uh, militias from Afghanistan and Iraq that they have brought to Syria. Uh, if it is in Western Iraq that they are trying to uh, establish a possible uh, missile threat vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Uh, if it is with the Houthis in Yemen, and as I've said, their relations with Hamas in Gaza. All, all, in all these uh, uh, areas, we have a potential threat of proxies of Iran vis-a-vis -vis Israel. All these areas are, uh, are able to, uh, to um, uh, uh, launch rockets, not rockets, missiles and UAVs to Israel, and reach Israel territory. So it might be from Hezbollah in Lebanon, it might be from Syria, it might be from Iraq, Western Iraq, as well as the Houthis. And of course, Hamas, we know that every some years we have a round of uh, rockets and missiles from, uh, from, uh, Hamas, from Gaza to Israel. So from Israel's point of view, as I said at the beginning, there are two different threats that Iran is, is posing. One of them is a strategic one, and that is the nuclear one. Because assuming what Iran has today in the Middle East, once they have the, the nuclear umbrella, they might do things that they are not doing today, and they might retaliate in ways that they are not doing today. But the very immediate threat uh, less strategic, but more immediate, is the threat around Israel on our borders. And this is something that has a potential for an escalation even to a, a, a war um, without, uh, without uh, any development on the nuclear uh, 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 area. And why is it a potential escalation? Because Israel, is, Israel has decided that it will not allow Iran to establish a, what is called by some colleagues in Israel, a war machine in Syria. And therefore you can hear from time to time that there are strikes that Israel is striking in, in Syria, wherever there is the intelligence, good intelligence of arms that Iran is bringing from Iran, from Iran to, uh, to Syria, if it's through the land, through Iraq and the, a common border between Iraq and Syria, or is it coming with uh, airplanes? Uh, and then the transfer of precise missiles and the technology of precise missiles from Syria to Lebanon. Now, uh, I assume that even if we succeed to stop 50-60%, the others are going to Hezbollah. And, uh, and, one, and from Israel's point of view, uh, if Hezbollah will have a huge number of, miss, of precise missiles that can uh, attack any point in Israel, uh, that is a strategic threat because Israel is a small country, is uh, very much dependent on, um, on the air force, on the logis logistics uh, basis uh, through Israel. And if Hezbollah will be able to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, attack Israel with those precise missile, missiles, it will be a very, uh, a very uh, deep, I don't want to say it's not a strategic one, but it's a very difficult situation for Israel and a very costly one. And therefore I do think that once there is a potential that Israel will decide one day that uh, the situation is uh, such, uh, uh, that the amount of, of uh, transfer of the technology as well as of parts of missiles is such one that threatens Israel 
and uh, will decide to uh, stop it this way or the other, and it will escalate to a, a wider um, a military conflict. Um, now, let me say about a word about, uh, there are also good developments, of course, and that is the Abram Accords between Israel and the, uh, uh, the Emirates and Bahrain. Um, this is a development that uh, is, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that the relation between Israel and those countries, uh, the secret relations uh, uh, were going for years and the intelligence cooperation, the fact that those countries decided to openly have a Israeli, uh, uh, Israeli uh, Bahraini, Israeli Emirati relations with ambassadors and to see the Israeli president visiting the Emirates and the defense minister visiting Bahrain. This is something that uh, is a major, it's on one hand, it's a very important development for Israel uh, Israel always wanted to be accepted in the region and to have, uh, and that is uh, together with the uh, uh, with the treaties, peace treaties that we have with Jordan and the, and the Egypt, it widens uh, the spectrum of Israel's uh, relations in the in the region, and of course is a very uh, negative development in the eyes of the Iranians, and therefore we see Iran threatening those countries. Uh, in different ways, and sometimes also in a way using the Houthis to launch missiles and, uh, uh, and the ballistic missiles and UAVs on Saudi Arabia, on uh, the Emirates, as we just saw in the, in the last couple of weeks. So um, on one hand, Iran is talking with the, those countries and, want, and needs them for its economic cooperation and is using the Emirates uh, uh, for its trade with the world. On the other hand, they are uh, hinting from time to time to those countries that uh, once they will jeopardize the security of Iran, Iran has many ways to retaliate and have many ways to uh, threaten them. Um, and since those countries are uh, weak, even though they have very good equipment and they are small and weak, and they don't believe that the US will uh, come to their support. Um, they understand the message coming from, from Tehran. So they, they, uh, uh, when we look on the, on the, on the, re on the region uh, uh, around Israel, as well as in the Gulf, we see a mixture, mix of pic a picture that is a mix uh, of some good developments, positive developments, and some very negative developments. Uh, let me say a word about uh, the uh, international community um, and its relations vis-a-vis -vis Iran and how does Iran uh, see its relations with, those, with, uh, with the international community. So first of all, what is important to say is that uh, uh, it looks as if uh, it's not a, a new phenomena, but it is very strongly um, emphasized by the new uh, president in Iran. Uh, of course, you all know, and I, I understood you had a, a very good uh, meeting with uh, Professor Meir Litvak. So you know that in Iran, the one who decides is the leader and not the president, the spiritual leader. Uh, but the president, the current president that was chosen by the leader and was uh, um, and is uh, present, uh, representing his views, uh, Whatever he is saying, the policy that he is uh, uh, promoting is something that is uh, in the direction, uh, completely in the direction of the, of the leader. So there is the, an emphasis in Iran today, in Iran's international policy, uh, saying we are um, trying to say to the, to the West and especially to the US, we are not in a situation where you can buy economic pressure Make us, uh, make us give up our national interest. We have Russia and China. And therefore what we see in the last couple of, of years, but specifically now in the emphasis now in, this, in the Raisi government is um, this uh, agreement of the 25 years agreement between Iran and, and China. Agreement that uh, as many positive uh, achievements for China, of course. One of them is the low level of, uh, 
oil that Iran is, uh, is uh, selling to China. But at the same time, there, is, there are some very important achievements for Iran as investment of uh, Chinese companies in Iran. Uh, and of course, there are those Chinese companies that are not, that are not dependent on the US in any way. And for the time being, the, the, the difficult relations, not to say more uh, between China and the US doesn't encourage the government in China to put any obstacles on uh, uh, companies that want to invest in uh, Iran. And uh, the same goes for the relations with Russia. Just three weeks ago, there was a visit of the, of the, of the new president Raisi in uh, Moscow. Uh, there is a framework uh, that, they, uh, that they are trying to complete of a kind of a strategic relation between Russia and, uh, and Iran as well. Um, I, I would say the, uh, the Russian-American relations and the issue of uh, Ukraine today is uh, of course a, a, a very important element in the decision making of, of Putin when it comes to uh, his relations with Iran and of course to uh, his position as well as the Chinese one in the dialogue between the, P the four, it's not the P5 because the US is not in the dialogue, it's the P4 plus one, plus one Germany and Iran. So on one hand, we hear China and Russia uh, in Vienna saying that they are supporting uh, the going back of US and Iran, uh, going back to the JCPOA. On the other hand, they are supporting the demands of Iran. Some of them are demands that uh, the US administration will not be able to accept. And the question of course uh, remains whether they are uh, playing uh, the double, uh, double face uh, game, the, on one hand supporting going back, on the other hand supporting the demands that they understand that will uh, not enable the sides to go back to the JCPOA. Um, the, uh, the, what is interesting, I think, in, in, the, in, in what is uh, uh, in the international relations that Iran is, uh, uh, is trying to uh, uh, enlarge with China and Russia, and uh, is that um, probably the evaluation, they might be wrong, but the evaluation today in Tehran is that economic pressure from the US, even if there is a relief of sanctions, and even if they go back to the, to, to the JCPOA and there is a relief of sanctions, it will not, um, it will of course su support the, econo the economy of Iran because Iran will be able to export oil. Uh, they are doing it today also because China is violating the uh, sanctions. Uh, they are not, not in the level that they have been doing before, but uh, quite uh, half of that they already have. And since the oil prices are high, they have better revenues, but still they would like to have uh, the relief and to be able to export more and to bring back their frozen money that they have in, in different countries like uh, South Korea, like Japan and others. So there is a, an interest, of course, in Iran to get these benefits. But I think when they evaluate the, the whole picture, in difference to, to what was in 2015 when this agreement was achieved, uh, Iran understands the limits of the, uh, the, support, the support to its economy that will be part of the relief of sanctions. Because many companies in the West, uh, in Europe as well, uh, of course in Europe, because the US doesn't have any connections, economic relations with Iran, uh, will you think twice if they want to invest in Iran, uh, if in uh, two years, in two, two and a half years, uh, something like that, there will be a, a Republican president in Washington and he will go back from the, from the agreement. So they, the Iranians understand that uh, the benefits of uh, sanctions are less today than they have been uh, hoping in 2015. And therefore they want to get more than just those uh, sanctions. And they want to make sure that their economic relations with China and Russia are, uh, are widening, are uh, stable, are solid for, for years to come. 
and to make sure that the, it will be a kind of compensation to everything that they might lose, uh, either if there is no agreement, and even if there is an agreement, and many uh, European companies will decide not to go back to Iran. So this is a, a this is a, a, a general picture that I wanted to put the emphasis on issues that are important and relevant uh, to Iran and its policies in the region, in the international uh, uh, arena, as well uh, as vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Uh, let me just add two uh, last uh, comments and then uh, we'll start, we, we'll open for questions. And uh, the first one is that in the last two years, we see a widening, uh, um, uh, widening uh, struggle, let's call it, uh, between Israel and Iran uh, in the cyber realm, as well as in the, uh, in the sea. Uh, it is a little bit uh, constrained in the last half a year in the sea, but the cyber activity between Iran and Israel is uh, quite wide, quite, uh, um, I would say, uh, getting to places where uh, uh, um, to civilian places where uh, uh, where the question of what is the aim of uh, of these uh, activities uh, from what we have been uh, searching and looking uh, upon the activities of the Iranians it looks that it is um, not only for a uh, trying to get more information uh, 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 about things that are important for them in Israel, but I think it's more and more, it looks like more and more um, a struggle to make, um, how should I call it, a kind of a, um, by, let me put it in a different way, by putting out a lot of information of, uh, of civilians that they have hacked through companies that they have reached to, they hope to put, to put such a pressure on the government that things are not working in Israel. We saw a lot of activity of Iranians, uh, Iranians, uh, of course, not as Iranians, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, demonstrations that happened in Israel, trying to enlarge demonstrations against the government against the previous government, as well as against the current governments. And there is a kind of an, uh, of an activity that looks like uh, trying to make, to enlarge or, or to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, contribute to instability uh, in Israel. Uh, it's not uh, enough uh, what they are doing in order to, of course, to succeed. But it's very interesting that the focus of their activity is within this direction. So let me uh, stop here and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Sima. Uh, that was really uh, superb. It was wide ranging and detailed in depth, unpacked a lot. And I'm sure there are a good number of questions. Uh, there are some starting to co come in from our audience, but I'm going to also, of course, be turning to uh, my co colleagues uh, on the panel as well for questions. Uh, let me just start with um, a large question. Uh, uh, What are the alternatives for, for Israel and the West in uh, addressing uh, Iranian nuclear, let's talk, talk about nuclear science or nuclear engineering. Uh, it's there. Uh, I would think if I were sitting in Tehran, I might argue that um, I've now gotten to the point of domestic expertise and capability that I can declare myself a threshold state, not a nuclear weapon state, a threshold state that has the knowledge, expertise and capability of using my the nuclear science for civilian purposes. Uh, 
and uh, and use that as a way to open up um, opportunities such as the removal of sanctions and the stability of international relations and new opportunities uh, and opening myself up to IAEA inspections and being a, an accepted part of the NPT regime, the non-proliferation regime, because um, I've not broken that barrier. But I, I'm making it clear that I have the capacity to, if I deem it to my advantage or necessary. Is that not... Uh, a, a rational and logical strategy for the leadership in Tehran to pursue? That's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> I would say that, uh, first of all, um, the issue is a broad, a broad issue of um, how does the regime perceive itself and the, what are the goals of this regime? And whether it is uh, one of its goals is to be accepted, legitimate, uh, et cetera. Um, first of all, I would say you, uh, this regime and especially this leader uh, does not believe the Americans. He didn't believe them before. He was saying it loudly and very, uh, everyone understood it. Even when he accepted the uh, agreement in 2015, he said, I accept it, but I have to tell you, don't believe the Americans. Don't talk to them on any other issues and don't believe them. And now after what Trump has done, he's only feeling himself much more sick to be more, uh, more sure about his policy. So that's one thing. The other one is ideological. You see the, the um, antagonism to the West, to the US and to Israel, is a very profound, a very, uh, how should I say, something that you can, a very, a very important element in the ideological uh, aspect of this regime. Otherwise, why should they put all this pressure on their own people? Why do, would they put pressure on, the, on Westerns that are coming to Iran? This is something, a core issue in the ideological, uh, um, a, a, a basis of, of, this, of this regime. Now, Iran, as you correctly mentioned, uh, says from the beginning, it's a civilian project. We are not a threshold. We are nothing. We are not going for any nuclear device, but nothing, everything they are doing is in this direction. And the question I think that uh, should be um, should be asked now. First of all, they're very close to be a, a threshold country, very close to that. Um, the question, uh, everybody uh, puts the line, the red line of a threshold uh, 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 state uh, differently, but they are very close. Uh, and I would say that perhaps we ever even can call them a threshold country. The question is that, that I put for myself, is whether there is not a change in Iran, and we'll see it in a couple of weeks, whether there is no, for the first time, a change, a profound change in Iran, in a decision to go for a nuclear, military nuclear capability. Because uh, otherwise uh, you would be correct to say, why don't you go back and be more legitimate, get the relief of sanctions and be, I think uh, one, they have lost their hope that the um, relief of sanctions will make a, a huge change in the economic situation. They understand that part of the, of the, of the reason for the current economic, harsh current economic situation is uh, not because of the sanction. It's because of uh, mismanagement, it's because of corruption. Uh, they understand it. They don't know how to handle it and they are not able to handle it because whenever they want to, for instance, to minimize subsidize, automatically there are demonstrations and they go back on their decision. They don't know how to do it and, uh, and they decide to try and uh, hold the situation as far as they can and try to find other alternatives. But uh, but uh, I don't think I don't 
I don't know to, to say, you know, uh, there is a debate in the INSS between uh, uh, among the people dealing with this issue on the American side, on the Iranian side, whether uh, we'll see, and going back at the end of the di dialogue in Vienna, we'll see, uh, we'll see uh, uh, the both sides going back to the uh, agreement. And I, for a long, long time until uh, this day, was thinking that um, Iran doesn't have good reasons to go back to the agreement. Uh, because uh, because of all the reasons that I've said before. So, uh, I don't know, it's a question uh, whether they will decide that the relief of sanctions in, and what they get from the Americans in the relief of sanctions and not what they demand is good enough in order to roll back a lot of their, of their uh, uh, achievements. And of course, the question that we didn't mention yet, that's the question of uh, military threat. Does the Iranian regime uh, perceives a, a Biden administration as a military, as a possible military threat in the future, um, or Israel as a military threat to, if they don't go back to the agreement? Uh, for the time being, it doesn't look like that. So th this this is also part of the. Um, of the, of the equation that uh, Iran has at the end of the day to decide uh, how, how it handles its, uh, its policy with, uh, on the nuclear issue. John Allen, please. Um, this is a direct follow on to what you just said, uh, Seema. Um, the United States has said, uh, we will do what it takes if uh, Iran does proceed past threshold to become a nuclear uh, state. Um, and uh, of course, we've heard um, many threats from Israel uh, on similar lines. Um, so I guess we, we've seen uh, the Americans uh, draw red lines and then when the red lines were crossed, uh, <clears throat> not react. Um, what is your assessment? You've spoken about what Iran thinks. What's your assessment of, uh, of the US and are they prepared to seriously uh, engage in military activity in that very complicated region? And then there's always the question, ancillary question of um, despite what Israel says, are they really capable of, I mean, they're certainly capable of assassinating people. They're certainly capable of, of attacking Iranian technology, uh, et cetera, but, but are they capable and would they uh, be interested in, uh, in attacking if the US didn't? Uh, or is that uh, basically uh, encouraging the US to do it? The question. <laughs> Um, I'll try to answer, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer all the aspects of this question. First of all, um, and therefore it's easier for me to talk about Iran is thinking about it. Um, first of all, I as to the capabilities, because many times I'm asked, uh, is it possible to uh, eliminate this nuclear project, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So first of all, I want to say, that uh, as far as I understand, uh, if the US decides uh, to attack the project, uh, it will do it um, in a very short period of time. And uh, it doesn't have to uh, attack all the places where uh, centrifuge are produced. It has to, uh, uh, to attack and to destroy four or five places, not more than that and uh, Iran will not have a program for many, many years. Unless, of course, they have a secret uh, place somewhere that they have already built a, built a, a bomb and uh, we don't know, but about what we don't know, we cannot talk. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Uh, is it possible to, uh, uh, to make such a, a, a damage to this program? Um, so that was about the US. The other question would be, is there a will in the US to do it? And uh, we always uh, say that uh, uh, the US has the capability but doesn't have the will. 
Uh, Israel has the will and there is a question mark of how much capability. But um, I think, first of all, uh, for the time being, there is no will in the US to be involved in any war in the Middle East. Now, uh, to attack the Iranian program, does, uh, the nuclear program doesn't mean a war. But the Americans are thinking in uh, terms of a war. They don't have to, to uh, invade Iran. They don't have to do anything. And, uh, and the question of the retaliation is a, uh, is a big question that uh, I'm talking to so many Americans about this issue. And I always try to tell them, uh, no question that there will be a retaliation, no question that first of all, the retaliation will be on Israel. Uh, and uh, it will be from Hezbollah, from Lebanon, from Syria, from uh, everything that Iran can do vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But the big question is what they will do vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Americans. And here I would say, once, the, uh, the, once Iran doesn't have any more a nuclear program after a, an American attack, uh, the calculation to attack the Americans' uh, bases in Bahrain, in Qatar, is a different calculation, quite different. So I think no question there will be terror activity, etc. But when we are talking about uh, the possibility and the retaliation and how does it send, this is one thing that everybody has to take into account. But as I said that before, there is no political will to be involved in any, any war in the Middle East, in any um, clashes in the Middle East. And uh, I think this is the, the very uh, important uh, understanding in Tehran that allows them to drag legs in the negotiations in Vienna. Even though, uh, as you also mentioned, uh, President Biden has said it clear and loudly, Iran will not become a nuclear state, uh, not only on his uh, watch, but also to, he stayed at the beginning on his watch and then he, he um, corrected it ever, uh, but what does it mean? And here I think there is a big gap between what Israel sees, uh, how Israel, uh, uh, what is the perception of threat in Israel? And it is uh, uh, in the perception of threat in the US. And uh, that is, uh, it's quite understandable uh, if we look on, uh, on the differences of uh, capabilities and the uh, geostrategic location. And uh, therefore, I think, um, I do think that Israel is uh, uh, nearing a very, very uh, crucial crossroad that could be um, a point in time that Israel will, uh, will have to uh, take very difficult decisions. Once there is no agreement, Iran will continue to enlarge its program uh, and it will be very close uh, to being able to break out or sneak out, as we call it sometimes, uh, to a military capability. And we know that uh, from the uh, material that was brought from Tehran, from the uh, archive of the denuclear archive, parts of the nuclear archive that were brought by the Mossad to Israel, that the direction that uh, the uh, scientists and all others have got is for five devices. And I don't have any reason to believe that what was in, uh, in 2004-05 uh, is today less. It should be more and not less. So um, we might get to a point where, um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens in Vienna. I saw today that uh, uh, during the talks that were just yesterday between the heads of the national security in Israel and in the US, uh, there was a leak coming out as if the Israeli position uh, that was, uh, was presented in Washington uh, was saying that it's better uh, to be with Iran without an agreement than with Iran, Iran with an agreement. Um, which is, uh, it's not my evaluation, I think differently a little bit, uh, but I understand what, what, how the thinking goes in Jerusalem and why they are saying it, because there is a huge, huge um, concern that once all, uh, all uh, sanctions are removed, 
Iran will have a lot of money, will be able to support its proxies in the region, and be, will be much bolder in the region uh, because they will count on the fact that the US doesn't want to jeopardize the achievement of the uh, agreement, going back to the agreement, and they will be much bolder in the, in the region and uh, more, more capable in the region and vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. So I understand where, where uh, this uh, policy comes from, but since I look on the nuclear issue uh, as the most, most problematic uh, threat and the others less, I think that uh, still uh, rolling back uh, the program, even though uh, the knowledge cannot be rolled back, uh, is better for Israel, but we have different evaluations. Thank you. Dylan? Thanks, Seema. Uh, all very interesting. Um, so I remember talking to David Menashri, who I'm sure you know um, in Israel, who, who's also an expert on Iran, probably 10 years ago. And he would say there are two trains departing, and one of them carries in a nuclear Iran, and the other carries a change in regime in Iran. And our, the West's job is to slow the nuclear change so that the, the change in regime train can, can arrive. Um, what do you think that, I mean, how stable is the regime there? And if there was an attack by the West, do you think that that would galvanize support in a rally around what we call rally around the flag effect um, inside Iran? Or do you think it would potentially destabilize the regime there? Um, yeah, I know uh, Professor Menashe and, and I appreciate his work very much. Um, you see, uh, these two trains, unfortunately, one train is very close to, uh, to its uh, last uh, stop. Uh, the other one, uh, the change of regime, uh, one I have to say, uh, we, it's very difficult to evaluate uh, the possibilities of a change of regime because uh, once you, from the outside, think that there is a, a, a possible change of regime, Probably the regime knows it better and it will do everything that is needed in order to stop any such uh, development. But uh, if I'm looking on what, and that was, I think, in a way, um, the uh, understanding in, uh, in Washington in the period of, of Trump, uh, to think that the more pressure, maximum pressure that will be used vis-a-vis -vis the regime will, at the end of the day, bring to a change of regime or to Iran, uh, uh, willing to go to a, a much better agreement uh, without any sunset for, for 50 years or something like that. Uh, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because this regime um, has learned how to uh, cope with demonstrations. Uh, it, was, it was once on, a, on, the, on the brink of a, such a, a change, and that was in 2009. Um, since then, and, and the regime had a, a huge trauma at that time because they, they didn't anticipate something like that happening. Uh, but since then, they have learned how to uh, manage all the demonstrations around the country. Uh, they are willing to kill people on the streets, and they have done it in 2019. Uh, I want to remind you that they have come to support Bashar Assad and together with him and the Russians were killing Syrian people. So this regime uh, knows uh, that in order to stay in power, you, you need to be uh, willing to kill your own people. So that's one thing. And the other one is that there is um, no question that there is in Iran a huge, a big percentage of, of people that are against this regime. We see it in the demonstrations. We see it with women against hijab. Every time we see it, but there are still millions of people that are part of the regime. And for, for them, uh, the, the, the stability of the regime is the, the, the stability of their lives. And therefore they are willing, they are willing to gather uh, uh, around the flag. I don't think the whole population will gather around the flag once there is an attack on the, uh, on the, uh, only on the nuclear sites, not on the people, not on the cities, uh, with the, with the uh, right uh, uh, explanation to the people, I think the regime 
this is the reason the regime is afraid from such an attack, not because it will harm the nuclear project, but because they don't be, they think that it might also uh, jeopardize the political uh, links of uh, of the different groups in Iran, and that people will think that the regime uh, doesn't have any more the, the same control it had before. And I think there is a potential in such a situation, but um, only with economic pressure, uh, I don't think it will happen. Uh, Mark, do you have it? No, I, I uh, was going to ask a similar question to Dylan, so I'm quite okay. I'm so let me turn back to, to Dylan then, and then I have sure. a, a question or two from the audience. Um, so another question about the domestic side in Iran. Um, do you see any difference between the different camps? Like we hear about the moderate camp versus the conservative camp. And, you know, over the years, I mean, Ahmadinejad was very bombastic um, and you haven't seen, you know, the same bombast from, from leaders in recent years. Um, any, any commentary on that? Is there any real difference or is it, you know, sort of the same line in terms of the external threat perception throughout the, the government there? So first of all, um, uh, theoretically, there is a difference between the camps, but the, 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 uh, the actual situation is that one camp, camp was destroyed by the other. And today what we see, of course, uh, I have to say at the beginning, uh, first of all, that both camps want to see the, uh, uh, the want to preserve the system. It's not that the reformists uh, that were the reformists Hatemi at that time wanted to change the system. It is that they believe that in order to preserve the system, you need to give the people more, more freedom, more, uh, more things, more uh, better eco economic life, uh, economic situation and the better jobs and all these things. It's not in order to change the system, but to, to, to uh, a little bit, uh, I would say open the system. But what we see in the last years and the election of Raisi is the last, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, stamp on this, uh, on this new, uh, um, new, I would say new allocation of all the conservative people in the important institutions in Iran in a way that I would say the leader is preparing for the day that he will not be there anymore to make sure that the all important institutions in Iran are uh, people that are at the head of those institutions are people like him and think like him and want to be uh, to continue the system the same way uh, and not to open it. Rouhani, for instance, he for all the years he was the representative. We are think, thinking about him as if he is a moderate one. He's the one that in 99 gave the order to kill students in Tehran when they were demonstrating. He was the representative of the leader for all the years that, uh, and everything. But he was believing that in order to preserve the system, you have to give more and to give more to the people and to give hope to the people. And he was believing that by going to the, um, to, uh, by uh, going to, a, to the agreement and uh, using the achievements in order and rolling it back and getting the, uh, uh, the relief of sanctions, he will preserve the system in a better way than uh, the others. But um, uh, of course, in, in, I, I have to ad admit in this uh, respect that the debate between the two camps, the one that was thinking that relations with the West will contribute more to the economy of Iran than uh, relations with the East, uh, uh, and that's in, uh, contrary to the uh, conservative camp, the more radical one that were uh, for many years were, th uh, were talking about relations with Russia and China as a uh, real as a uh, different from the relations with the West. That uh, the Trump decision to leave the agreement uh, made uh, uh, how should I use my words a harmful. Uh, 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 strike to the, to this camp, and actually this camp today is very very uh, quiet, 
And um, I, I even think that not only that they are quiet, uh, some of them are afraid for themselves because the, the, what we hear in Iran against Zarif, against Rouhani, against the, the line, the diplomacy that they were promoting is something that I'm sure they are thinking that it might come to a situation where they will be even a, a threat to the regime, perceived to be a threat to the regime. John, before I turn to you, let me take one or two from the audience. Um, there are two questions really that um, are similar, that overlap. Uh, and they both have to do with a very, uh, a strong view of Iran as um, a, a state that, whether it can be trusted, that it treats its people poorly, um, it, uh, it has been building up its arms capability. It's uh, pursuing deep relations with China and, 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 and Russia. Uh, I think both questions are really asking, is, is there, is there um, anything other than uh, a negative reality around Iran as an actor, in the region, Iran as a member of the international community in terms of the Iranian state, and, and that there is this uh, dangerous alliance building up between Russia, China, and Iran. And, and, and whether or not that fundamentally un undermines those who are looking for negotiated uh, agreements and uh, safety from the longer term uh, threats. The strategic concerns. Yeah, uh, first of all, I think um, it's very difficult to believe Iran, and I wouldn't believe Iran, but saying that, uh, one has to admit that the years between 2015, actually January 16, where the implementation day, until uh, May uh, 18, two and a half years, uh, Iran was adhering to the agreement. They didn't violate the agreement. All the inspections that uh, were done by the IAEA um, were positive from the point of view that Iran is not violating the agreement because this agreement was in the interest of Iran. Iran wanted to benefit from the relief of sanctions, wanted to improve its economy, and they, they are not and they were not in any hurry to get to the bomb. They don't need it tomorrow more than they need it yesterday. So there is no, uh, there, there, was, uh, there was a chance for a period of time that Iran uh, could be uh, trusted because that was their own interest. They knew that at the end of the time of this agreement, they will have the legitimacy to do anything they want except for a, a nuclear device because they are uh, one of, they signed the NPT and uh, they are, they are uh, not permitted to have a nuclear bomb. But uh, otherwise they could do everything and therefore they were uh, quite um, willing to uh, benefit the use of the agreement in order to, the, to get to the sunset and be able to uh, do everything they want with more advanced centrifuge, with uh, bigger numbers, quantities of uh, fissile material and everything uh, that uh, is allowed beyond the level of a nuclear uh, device. Um, today, the picture is very different, uh, and I do think that um, I think that Iran uh, cannot be trusted because at the same time they feel they cannot trust the West. And therefore it's uh, uh, the distrust between the two sides, the US and Iran, is in such a level that um, it is very difficult, very difficult to see, um, a, a real going back, a, a full, full going back to the uh, to the JCPOA and um, and um, no, it's uh, even if they go back, the Iranians uh, understand that they uh, the years from uh, 2015 until 2022 have passed. They have uh, achieved a lot during those years. 
and they have more uh, eight years or something like that in order to finish with this agreement. And even if they go back, it's short time for them uh, and to, to uh, they, uh, it's short time to get to the point where they have the legitimacy uh, to continue with the program uh, and to be more acceptable and, uh, and legitimized in the world, in the international community. So uh, it's, a, it's a different Iran in several years if, we, uh, if uh, the current situation continues. And uh, you know, if you remember the Biden administration started by saying, we will suggest Iran to go back to the agreement, relief of sanctions and everything, in order, and then we'll start, that will be the first phase, and then we'll start negotiations for longer and stronger. That was the, uh, uh, the uh, diplomacy that uh, the Biden administration came to, uh, suggesting to have a longer and stronger agreement with Iran after both sides go back to the agreement. Um, there are no chances for longer and stronger, and there are small chances, but still there are, uh, for going back to something that will be close to the JCPOA. Just to fo follow up on that, so there, the, the issues on timelines, on sunset clauses, on enhanced inspections, um, those kinds of things now, uh, to, to improve on those, that requires a level of trust and confidence in the, the other that neither party really has. You see, if if at the end of the day they will get back to what something that will be agreed by the Americans and Iran, uh, and that of course will include no question a wider inspection and uh, everything that was within the JCPOA uh, for a period of time, uh, probably we will uh, see Iran uh, adhering to to what they will uh, uh, sign to, uh, but it's. Uh, there is no way to go back to the JCPOA. Even when I'm saying going back, I don't mean going back exactly, because what Iran has learned in this year cannot be erased right. uh, because uh, the period of time uh, until the end is uh, half of the, of the time. So there is no real uh, possibility to do it. And there is of course a, a, a big uh, question whether Iran has not used this time that the inspection is so low, uh, so uh, uh, poor that they have done some things that might uh, allow them to uh, sneak out, as we call it, and to have material somewhere else and to do things somewhere, uh, somewhere else. Um, the situation today, I'm, the only thing that can be said is worse than it was in January 20, 2016 when the implementation day. And uh, not that it was so perfect. No one should, uh, uh, should think that I was thinking that the JCPOA was perfect. Not at all. There were several flows that, are, that were very important to understand. But there wasn't, a, and a, from my point of view, there was an understanding that after several years, uh, another American administration will try to negotiate for something better, for longer, for better, and Iran will see that it benefits from, uh, a, from uh, using the capabilities that they have, but not going the, the uh, extra mile until, uh, 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 on the nuclear sphere, uh, the extra mile uh, to the uh, nuclear device. So that was my, my thinking, you know, that I saw that it was a perfect agreement. Right. Now I have one more question from an audience, and that then I'll turn to John. Uh, this is from Elliot Jacobson. He, I'll just re read it because it's quite short. With reference to your comments about the 25 year agreement between Iran and China, does mm -hmm. that impact one way or the other the apparent deepening of the PRC Israel commercial activities and ch Chinese investment? Um, so as to Israel's China and the investments, uh, this issue is uh, quite um, a delicate issue, not only because Iran China, but more important because US China, which right. is a major issue in Israel uh, in Israel's policy today. Uh, there is um, 
uh, a lot of rethinking in Israel about how to handle this problem. Uh, we have had um, a very, uh, very, um, I would say, blunt um, threats, even not only uh, demands from uh, Washington on uh, what should be done vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And I think Israel uh, understands that um, it cannot play with this issue. Uh, for us, it was very important, the investments that the Chinese could uh, invest in Israel because uh, they, as you know, they have a lot of money and uh, we thought uh, we could, uh, um, we could uh, control what we are doing with them in a way that will not jeopardize our relations with the US. But um, it doesn't look like that for, as for now, I think. Um, you know, uh, Iran, China, uh, Iran is not important for China from the economic point of view. China is very important to, for Iran, but Iran is not important for China. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are much more important for China. So um, uh, of course we understood uh, that China uh, is, um, uh, in a way supporting, not in a way, supporting Iran, investing in Iran, uh, but, uh, and we understood that we cannot uh, challenge it. But uh, I think it was, a, it was a, a calculated uh, policy in Israel to try and see how we, we can manage also uh, investment, Chinese investment for the benefit of, of Israel. Um, it becomes more and more difficult, more and more difficult. Um, and it will be an issue, I, I believe, in uh, in the coming uh, in, in this year and the coming years between Israel and China. It is going to be a delicate uh, dialogue between the two countries. Right. Thank you. Um, there's a lot more we could unpack on that that one. That's very very interesting. John. Um, <clears throat> so you explained it, and in your article you also mentioned it that uh, the. One of the reasons that Israel's not interested in a, in a deal is because it will provide more money to Iran. Uh, it will give them some diplomatic status, um, and and this is a, a threat, uh, you know, potential threat from all Israel's neighbors, etc. But I mean, it, it, it strikes me that uh, you know Israel opposed the JCPOA. I think m most people like you. And many in Israel even now say, better to have had the JCPOA than to be where we are now. Now Israel is saying once again, for the reasons you said, I, I, we don't we don't want a JCPOA. We don't want a, a, a point two. We don't want anything. Well, where where does that leave the world? I mean, okay, you don't want it. Uh, we understand sort of why, but. Um, <laughs> It, that means that a military uh, threat um, is all that's left. Uh, that you know we're we're going to forget about negotiating with you. We don't trust you, and um, you just if you want to go ahead and do what you do, then uh, we're going to rely on the U.S. to attack. Uh, uh, you know, in in the way you said, it doesn't seem to be a very sustainable position. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, although Israel has to take care of its own interests, I get it, but diplomatically, internationally, it doesn't seem terribly sustainable. Um, I think the, um, um, the thinking in uh, Jerusalem is that uh, once there is no agreement and the, the talks in Vienna collapse and, uh, and the US understands that uh, US and Europe understand that uh, Iran is not going back. Uh, I think the, the understanding in Israel is, and correctly so, uh, that uh, a lot of pressure will be put on Iran. Uh, there, uh, there is a, um, in the last year, since everybody knew that Iran is going to, that the US is going to negotiate with Iran, there was a loosening of the uh, economic pressure. Uh, there are still things that the US can do. And uh, I believe that there is an, a, a thinking uh, in Israel that uh, once the, the US will put much more pressure on Iran and the, and the Europeans this time 
uh, in opposite to what happened during the Trump uh, period, will go together with the with the uh, uh, with the, the U.S. That uh, uh, Iran might be in a very difficult, in a much more difficult situation, uh, because at the end of the day, and this is something uh, I think uh, yeah, there is a logic in that, of course. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be done still. Uh, there is the uh, issue I did mention before within the within the JCPOA. There is the snapback. Snapback is a, a clause in the in the agreement that a country that thinks that the, the other one is uh, uh, violating the agreement can go to back to the Security Council and bring back all the sanctions, and there is no veto uh, capability to either of the sides. And this is something that might happen if Iran, uh, if everybody understands that the U.S. was willing to give a lot, and the Iranians decided for their reasons uh, that it's not enough. It might be that uh, one of the Europeans country will go to the, the US cannot do it because they left the agreement, but the, one of the Europeans country can go to the Security Council and uh, go for snapback. That will mean that all the, it, it doesn't mean a lot from the uh, economic point of view, but it means that it brings back all the sanctions of the Security Council. And that is a better, a, a better legitimate platform for the Europeans to put more pressure on Iran. So there are some, there is an issue between, uh, for instance, between the IAEA and Iran today. Uh, I didn't mention before, uh, there are a uh, three to four uh, sites where Iran uh, was operating, uh, was working with a uh, nuclear material uh, in the past was places that were not declared to the IAEA. And uh, Iran for the last two years doesn't give any answer to the uh, agency what happened there and where is the material that was there. So there are some open issues between the IAEA and Iran. And that means that uh, once, and actually the Americans have been threatening Iran on this issue last uh, December, that they will go for a uh, for a, a, a resolution in the board of governors in uh, Vienna, and the issue will be transferred to the Security Council, which means that they can put more pressure. So there are there are still and uh, and I also uh, understand that there there is a, 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 an understanding and it's correct that there is there are still steps that can be done. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, that will make their life more difficult, and I think at the end of the day, both Russia and China do not want to see uh, instability in the Middle East. Both of both of them do need stability, uh, of because of different reasons, but uh, but they understand that once there is no agreement. Uh, and uh, uh, Israel might provoke, might do something. So I, I think that basically at the end of the day, they would also prefer to see uh, a kind of, a, of an, an agreement between the US and Iran. And all these uh, reasons together bring uh, the, uh, the Israeli government to think that it's better not to have a bad agreement because any agreement, as they say, will, now will be a bad agreement. And I understand it, it will be a bad agreement. The JCPOA was less bad, but was had its own problems, and the current will be even uh, worse. No question about that. Uh, the question is whether it's better to have something for several years and try to use these years in order to prepare yourself in a better way. Uh, and there are the others who say um, that uh, it's better not to have an agreement, to not to have a bad agreement and to pay to put all this pressure on Iran without giving them all the money that they will get from the from the um, uh, relief of sanctions. I don't know, uh, you, uh, David, say that you followed my uh, panel with uh, on the annual conference. And if you remember, uh, Senator uh, Joe Lieberman, uh, that was his position. He said it's better to have not to have a bad agreement than to have a bad agreement with uh, all the relief of sanctions. Uh, so there, I don't I don't want to say that there is no logic in in this uh, way of thinking, uh, and uh, I think there was no logic in uh, um, encouraging Trump to leave the agreement. But there is a logic today in those who think uh, that um, let's try and, uh, and uh, use all the other uh, means that we have vis-a-vis -vis Iran uh, and see how it works because 
perhaps there is a, an evaluation that Iran doesn't want to break out immediately to a nuclear capability because it's still not there. Uh, it is afraid of a military activity. So I, I don't want to say that there is no uh, logic in Israel's uh, government position. Dylan or Mark, anything? Then, then let me close and give just a, a small question. Can you explain to us um, the logic the, of the Iranian logic on having a nuclear capability? I know this might require an invitation to, to come back, <laughs> but in a moment or two, can you try and, and uh, parse out the logic of, of is it has it to do specifically with the um, ambiguity of the Israeli uh, capability? Has it to do with Iran wanting to be perceived and reassert itself as a regional hegemon and a great power? Um, or is there, there could be other reasons, but it would seem to me it's a diversion of considerable resources, creating lots of problems problems that Iran doesn't necessarily need. So what's the logic behind the uh, effort for <laughs> nuclear? Since I, I looked on the watch and I have three minutes, uh, yes. I'll, summarize, I'll summarize it um, by saying, uh, one, uh, they saw uh, that nothing happened to North Korea by having the, the bomb. And what happened right. to Gaddafi for not having, while well, not having a bomb. So that's one. Two, uh, they believe that the US, and it, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican uh, a president or a Democrat one, want to see uh, the removal of the uh, revolutionary, Islamic revolutionary uh, regime in Iran. Uh, and they believe that they, uh, that by having uh, nuclear capability, uh, why India, why Pakistan, why as they say Israel and not we, the superpower in the region with all the history that you have heard about it and all, all the, uh, you know, Iran has uh, 85 million people. Uh, it's larger than uh, Germany. Um, so why not? Uh, and once we have it, uh, we'll see how they talk to us. Well, can't say with that optimistic note, <laughs> but I will say thank you very, very much for a thorough and entirely uh, captivating, uh, though difficult, di difficult discussion. Um, these are issues that clearly are not going to go away. They're going to become more, more complicated. Mm -hmm. And um, with that understanding, I hope you'll allow us to call, call on you again. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure I'm speaking from certainly my colleagues who organized this, that we're really very grateful for, for your time and your sharing of your expertise and, and insight. So thank you uh, very much. I hope wish you everyone agree. well and uh, soon a Shabbat Shalom and uh, <laughs> see many of you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.